In Billion Season 7 Episode 3, the intricate friendships and power structures of the series once more take center stage. The episode focuses on the intertwined lives of the characters, revealing their strategic choices and deep ambitions. Power, ethics, and relationships are explored against a backdrop of high-stakes money and politics in this episode. The episode is on track to be a satisfying conclusion to this gripping series thanks to its blend of character-driven moments and excellent narrative. Prince takes delight in outsmarting his adversaries by multiple steps, but his rivals are experienced players. Most of the time, Chuck Rhodes is a man of action. Ira, his best friend and recently hired deputy U.S. attorney, tells him in so many words that it was his unique combination of intellect and emotion that created him the man he is today. But Chuck has been repeatedly unmade by that mixture, and he is not the only one who is aware of this. Kate Sacker, his former protege turned enemy, claims to her supervisor Mike Prince that Rhodes's emotion prevents him from using his full intelligence, which is on par with Mike's and Kate's. Therefore, Chuck does not pounce when Kate and company provide a file for a political super PAC to support Prince's presidential campaign, a purposeful provocation designed to keep Chuck's operations in the open, which is acceptable if Chuck were working in a Hoover. Instead, he has a room full of solicitors eagerly awaiting the chance to use all of their talents against unsuspecting white-collar offenders everywhere, the same cases that made their recently restored boss a cherished member of society. Everyone, including his right-hand man Ira, his father Charles Sr., his button man Carl, and the brash rising star Amanda Tour of the Southern District, is frustrated by his hesitation in selecting his initial salvo. Chuck's co-workers reasonably want him to take aim at any target and fire, given his overall successful track record. Even Kareem Abdul-Jabber, posing as himself, is invited by Carl, Ira, and Charles Sr. for a pep session that is held in Grant's tomb. One of the episode's funnier and wiser moments is seeing Chuck construct an entire grandiose logic behind the choice of sight before learning the real reason. Thus, May Smith, the episode's writer, creates an intriguing conundrum. We viewers are aware of the good intentions of Chuck's brain trust and the sincerity and 99 times out of 100 appropriateness of their respect for Chuck as a hard charger. We viewers are also aware that this is a unique circumstance and that if the man follows his past course, he will unavoidably fall into Prince's trap. It's brilliant writing that raises the stakes by making both of Chuck's potential courses of action appear sensible from various perspectives, but never giving the true perspective to the character. In the end, Chuck benefits from his perceptiveness. While purposefully stepping on Prince's super PAC bait, he orders Carl and Ira to continue their investigation. Then he chooses Amanda's case as his actual first significant victory. He still possesses the same emotional intelligence that we all know and love, but he now has the ability to restrain that feeling until it is required, rather like the Hulk in Avengers. This episode's characters face many choices in addition to Chuck's. Nearly all of his ex-wife Wendy's patients at Prince Cap are secretly seeing a second psychiatrist for real therapy. She schedules a meeting with Dr. Eleanor Mayer to face the intruder because she is unwilling to accept that what she does is merely performance coaching and is more than a little enraged that her thief has been invaded. As a result, she ends up becoming one of the good doctor's patients. It just so happens that Mayer has Wendy's phone number. She rightly notes that performance-based therapy necessitates ongoing high performance. This goal is given priority over anything that would help her Prince Cap clients escape their hamster wheel. She also discovers that this causes Wendy to experience one of two emotions either like a errand girl running errands for her bosses to keep the money coming in or Chris-like, suffering to the best of her ability to redeem her patients' souls. Maybe Mayer's therapy will provide a solution for everyone. Wags is the third and last character in this week's episode who is looking for his missing mojo. His relationship with a politician who was trying to do good has damaged his reputation among other assassins and creeps on the street, where he was once a legend. He needs a major win, a definite victory, and a way to make a dramatic, even theatrical, comeback, just like Chuck does. Winston then appears. Despite himself, Twerpy Quan Winston has been a key member of the Taylor Mason team for some time. Winston leaves the company and launches his own company right away, like within eight hours. If he is permitted to sell the risk management software that he is pitching, which was obviously created on Prince Cap time and money, the company will suffer a significant financial and reputational harm. Following Wendy's advice, you can see why Dr. Mayer is worried, can't you? Wags bursts into Winston's apartment, 
where Taylor and Philip are already having a come to Jesus meeting, and all but attacks the man. But what was his true objective? Putting a bug in for Hall, the mercenary investigator for the company. In addition to Winston's possible client list, Hall unearths every nefarious act and nefarious Google search the former hacktivist has ever done. Winston receives all of this information from Wags, Taylor, Philip, and Kate in the conference room, where he will deliver his closing sales pitch to potential customers. Winston's reputation and wealth will be kept about as intact as ancient Carthage, unless he returns to Prince Cap with the software in Tao as a sort of indentured servant. A strong episode of Billions, which this unquestionably is, is like seeing someone play a puzzle game with Finnis, say, resolving a Rubik's Cube or finishing a level of Tetris. You watch in awe as deft hands move parts and panels from one location to the next until everything aligns precisely where it ought to. Both Chuck's allies and foes unintentionally direct him in the right direction. Wendy's obstinacy sets her up for a significant breakthrough. Wags gets the new kill he needs thanks to Winston's defection. Although billions makes it seem simple, if it were simple, everyone would be doing it. The mission of Taylor, Wendy, and Wags the fourth their boss ascent to power was conspicuously lacking from this episode, save for the occasional sharp glance or sad expression. They might have learned a lesson from Axe's rejection last week. If you can't beat him, join him council having at least briefly resonated with them. This week's program included the much-missed Sarah Styles as Bonnie, who was prominently present. The vulgar Axe Cap alum to her old haunts to narrate on Winston's new business venture. She then resumes her relationship with Dollar Bill, just as the lift doors slam shut on her. Ryan, who doesn't let her semblance of sisterly fondness for the little worm get in the way of crushing his hopes when Wags comes asking around, is another crucial source in the anti-Winston campaign. Author Michael Lewis makes a significant cameo in this episode, throwing the liar's poker soiree where Wags is humiliated and the great character actor Michael O'Keefe plays the person who humiliates Wags. By the way, did the old Bill Brasty sketches on Saturday Night Live come to mind when he and his friends were trading old Wags war stories?